up, everybody? It's your girl, Melissa Magonza Murphy, coming to you live from the Hired Podcast here at Sacramento State. My pronouns are she, they, and sis, and I'm super excited for this episode, and I know y'all will be too, but before we get started, you know I gotta bring in my best, best co-worker on campus, Emma Wadiak. What's going on? Melissa, I feel like I need to put together a trophy that's like <laughs> Melissa's favorite coworker on campus. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome back for season two. My name is Emma Wadiak, and I work in the Career Center as a career development specialist. And Melissa, I can't believe season two is already here. Season two is here. It is here, and I am so excited for today's episode. As you know, we're going to continue the tradition. We start each episode with a career myth. That's right. Let's see what the people think. Let's Mm -hmm. see. What do you got for us today? Today's career myth is that side hustles aren't professional and are not considered careers. Can we just take a moment to recognize how false that is? Uh, We can take many moments to recognize how false that is. Okay. I know so many folks that will say that they have a side hustle, but in reality, it's almost like their full-time job. Yeah. I mean, they, they're they always thinking about it, and when they're not at their 8 to 5, they're working towards it on weekends, in, in the evenings, I mean, in the morning, sometimes at lunch. They're mm-hmm. like, I actually have to step out because I have to take care of this, right? Right. You know? and, and sometimes they even bring it to the workplace. If you're a decorator and we're having some type of, like, event at work we're like can we, can Kathy come and mm-hmm. decorate for the party mm-hmm. yeah because Kathy's creations is lit right and right. this is something that they do and they do it extremely well absolutely mm-hmm. And I'm so happy that you mentioned how prevalent this is. I was actually doing some digging before this episode mm. because I'm like, how how common is this for people, really? And what I found, the, the most recent data I found was from 2017, so it's a few years old. But still, 17% of tax filers submitted a form to the IRS indicating receipt of self-employment income. In 2017, 17%. That's that Schedule C. Right? Mm -hmm. So even a few years ago, people were not just dabbling with this, but this was serious business. Like, this is happening. We are reporting it to the IRS. It does not get more official than this. (laughs) Right. Right? And so I think it's important that we break down the stigma around this because yes. it's it's not only just being done routinely but it's really important and people are getting a lot of gratification from it mm-hmm. it's serving really important purposes for them either you know from a personal level or from a financial standpoint so i think it's important that we speak to this a little bit more i mean absolutely and and just to think like there's so many different side hustles but in reality it really is a second job Mm -hmm. right and minimizing it by calling it a side hustle makes it seem like it's something that's not as important when in reality this is something that is a part of your livelihood right and sometimes people are actually making more money from these i'm gonna put air quotes here side hustles than they are from their eight to five and Mm -hmm. so it's time to really speak to that and own that and welcome all the new folks that probably launch businesses in this virtual time this year oh yeah absolutely i think with the nature of work right now people are having to get very creative oh yeah they're having to be very entrepreneurial Mm -hmm. and so i think this is only going to get more common given the space that we're in right now well our guest today is all about that side hustle making it a main hustle and leveraging it to really open up your own platform and be really successful today we have the founder of reclaiming your happiness with lemus michael lemus welcome to the space thank you for joining us here at the hired Thank you so much for having me back and for my welcome back to Sac State. I'm super excited to be here. Yes. People may not know, but Michael actually used to work on campus in student affairs, correct? I did. Yeah. I was actually the former program coordinator for the Cerna Center here. Amazing. Well, we are so happy to have you back and to speak to your lived experience with side hustles and progressing your career because we feel like you've done it remarkably well. So listeners can learn a lot from you, and I'm excited to have you share your story. To get things started, Michael, would you mind just telling us a little bit about your professional journey up to this point and really just sharing how you got to this point? 
Absolutely. So I'm going to take you back to 2013 because I feel like that's where a big part of the journey started. So I actually went to grad school to go ahead and study higher education and student affairs. So way back when, seven years ago, um, I was actually at Cal State Fullerton studying higher ed. And that's when I started my grad program and really fell in love with just higher education, working with students, um, and really the diversity work that we get to do in this field. And really since then, actually for the last couple of years, I've been working at a variety of institutions um, at the CSU, the UC, and the community college, um, working with students. And recently in the last year, I actually transitioned over to work in state government and then have also been running my business. So it's been a lot of work, a lot of transition, but it's also just been really, really exciting to just try new things and finally get to the point in my life where I feel like everything's just blending well together and it's really fitting my passion and I'm feeling so aligned with just who I am as a person. Um, but with all that, I mean, that experience has just been so critical and crucial to the overall journey. So I am excited to just continue expanding. Michael, you sound like you do it all. You're like (laughs) community college, UC, CSU, state government, self-employed. I'm like, when do you sleep? Good question. (laughs) (laughs) I try my best to get at least six to seven hours. I'm trying to do better at just like getting that rest in because that is also necessary to just keep up with everything. But it's a common question I get. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Well, at least I know I'm not the first to ask it. So awesome. I just am so excited that you shared that you went to graduate school for higher education because as someone that comes from a family of immigrants, the idea that you can get a degree titled higher education is like you opening in a restaurant called food, right? You know, it's like, of course you got higher education. Oh, you have a degree in that? I don't get it, right? And there's so many transferable skills that come out of higher ed that a lot of people probably don't even realize they're possessing, right? Yes. You learn how to organize, handle conflict, produce programs, you know, work with different people, different personalities, embrace equity and inclusion. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like those were transferable skills that you, excuse me, that you use to really move forward into what you're doing now? Absolutely. Um, so much so that I think we co-hosted a conference presentation on that, on transferable skills from higher ed. Yes. I mean, I I can't emphasize enough how much these transferable skills can apply to so many different fields. I mean, from marketing to outreach to planning conferences to going to all these meetings, drafting agendas like higher ed. If you're ever looking to go ahead and just look into another field after higher ed, it really does prepare you for so many different things. Mm -hmm. I mean, the communication skills you need to have with students, with faculty, with staff. I mean, it's absolutely so transferable. And I wish more people talked about that because it is definitely a needed conversation because I think in any field, sometimes people feel like they can only stay in that field because maybe that's what they got their degree in or that's just kind of what they've been in for the last, let's say, 10 years. You can always change like anything. And I think that's important to discuss, especially with students, because, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you go to school and then you realize like, oh, I actually want to try something new. And I don't think that should be frowned upon. Yeah. Yeah. I actually go to an acupuncturist. He's an older gentleman. And he's like, yeah, I was doing software engineering until seven years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're here for the switch up. We are right? here for that. Yes. Right. And like the career counselor in me is just so alive. On this <laughs> right like I want to know more about this. <laughs> like tell me your story. What happened here? But I'm sure you're like, but when did you know from software engineering to acupuncturist? I'm sure, you know, the person in you mm-hmm. is like, I am curious about this. Yes. Right? Absolutely. So Michael, if you could actually speak yes. to this a little bit with yeah. your own experience, at what point did you recognize that it was just kind of time to deep deviate from that higher education path. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. Cause I was actually in my role here when I was like, I need to take a trip somewhere and like figure myself out. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, they, you know, I think that that's important to discuss too. Cause you know, I've had the privilege to be able to explore like my own identities and just like who I am and get a chance to actually like look into different opportunities with the resources that I've been also given. Right. So I think that's important to discuss. So I took a trip I actually went to Washington. I went to the Orcas Island. Um, if you have not gone there, I highly recommend that you do because it's absolutely beautiful. But wait, are there actual orcas, or is that there just the title? Are. Yes. Oh, it's okay. like a freaking beautiful island. It's actually in between Canada and Washington. Um, so I took a chance to go there, and Exclusive. I went. I know it actually really felt that way. Um, <laughs> I went there for a couple of days, and I was like, I really need to do just some life exploration. Mind you, this is a whole freaking island and I did not know one person there but I just felt called to just like go so I did um 
And that's really where I figured out like, okay, I, th I think it's time to transition out of higher ed. Like I still very much love the field of higher ed, but I think on a personal level, I was looking for something different and just to expand upon my skills in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was there that I actually like developed the pillars of my platform and my business. So at the time, the business had already existed, but it was in its very much like baby stages. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have like pillars or what it was exactly. And it was on that trip. It was actually on the boat ride to the actual island because you take a ferry um, where I thought of the pillars. And so that arise that people know that stands for something. And so that that A is for advocacy. The R is for reclaiming your power. The I is for inclusion. S is for spirituality. And the E is for empowerment. So that's where it came to me. It was actually on that ferry ride. And that applies to every aspect of my business and platform mm -hmm. from the coaching to the products to the podcast, like everything that's a part of that is very much revolving around those pillars. And so I took that time. And when I came back, I was like, all right, y'all, it's time. Sorry, got to go. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I took some time to explore. And I think that's how I eventually also, you know, ended up pursuing my pathway in um, state government and then just spending more time on my business. I think that's how it all kind of happened. But it wasn't easy. You know, it really, I, it, it was like a kind of like a crossroads for me. Mm -hmm. That's really what it felt like. And I was like, it's just, it's time. Already with those transferable skills, I'm thinking about higher education and their love of acronyms. So when you bring <laughs> so up a rise, you're like the A <laughs> is C. for aspiration. The R is C. for... <laughs> Like, well, True. there's that higher education background. <laughs> we did say transferable skills, we right? We did say that. Yes. <sighs> well, Michael, okay. So you had this beautiful ferry ride that just spoke to your entire existence. And I want to <laughs> know more about the location after we're all said yes. and done here. But at what point did you feel like your side hustle was actually more than this passion project? And it was actually a part of your career? Yeah. So, you know, that's a really good question. The actual platform itself, so Reclaim Your Happiness of Lemus, started as a Facebook blog in the fall of 2018. Mm. And that actually stemmed from like an experience that I had encountered that was really just toxic. And there was a lot of toxic energy, toxic people around me at the time. And um, I actually decided that I was like, I need to leave that particular environment. And when I actually started to explore that more, I really started to find myself in like what reclaiming your happiness means. That's where the name of the platform actually came from. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually gave a conference presentation, a, a NASPA Western Regional Conference presentation, and it was like kind of like a TED talk um, on that, on reclaiming your happiness. And it was super powerful. And that's when I started that blog to discuss like some of the things that had happened to me, my experiences, and really to disclose like my mental health journey, which I can't tell you how many years I just like, I felt like I was presenting this mask to people where all I wanted people to see was like how perfectly put together I was in quotes, um, because I wasn't. And I think that that was really powerful because once that actually, that presentation happened, I think people saw like, wait, like this is a thing, like this can actually be a thing. They saw it before I even did. And I actually then met someone who eventually I invested in as a coach. Um, she actually runs a higher ed entrepreneur group now very big and well known on Facebook. Um, and I invested in a coach to explore more of this and like the potential behind it. And she's the first person who actually told me like, hey, this can actually be a business. Like, have you considered that? Mm -hmm. And at the time I'm like, really? Like what? Um, and yeah, she's like, you've like done professional advising, counseling programs, planning conferences, all of these things that can be a business if you choose to look into it. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the moment where I'm just like, this can be a thing. And flash forward to two years later, like I have a coaching program, coaching clients, like there's so many wonderful things that have come out of it, but I don't think that I would have pursued it if I didn't see like the own potential in this actual thing, or this passion project becoming an actual business. Right. Um, and that's so powerful. So I think it's also really cool and also necessary to have people that support you and that see the potential in you and that invite you into those spaces when even you're not in the room. I think that that's just so needed. Um, and it's just been amazing because I've had a lot of people like that in my life. Mm -hmm. Can you share more about what your business is and yeah. what this coaching practice actually looks like? Because yeah. I, I'm very curious to hear more and I imagine that listeners are too. Absolutely. Yeah. So I feel like I've taken such a different approach to your traditional coaching 
Um, and I say that because, and here's where the higher ed comes in. Um, I say that because, you know, the social justice aspect to it and so much of like conversations around spirituality and life coaching, sometimes people ignore identities or don't talk about social justice. So for me, developing like coaching services has very much been around reclaiming power, reclaiming your identity, reclaiming your happiness with a social justice lens and actually thinking about people's identities and level of access and level of, you know, resources that people have. So the main thing is that I actually offer out coaching services um, to a variety of people of just very diverse identities. And there is so much that goes into that coaching program. It's all about alignment and it's about aligning and finding balance and flow on a mental, physical, and spiritual level. Mm -hmm. um, so spirituality is highly embedded into the program. And that's also exciting because I think that that allows people to truly find themselves outside of what society expects them to be. I love it. Isn't it great? It's so great. I feel like it sounds so powerful. And thank you. You're doing this with your state job yes. currently, right? Yes. Right. Can we just talk about that for yeah. a minute? So, how are you establishing some of these boundaries around this very powerful personal practice yes. that you have going on? Which sounds to me like it really hits at the core of exactly what you're trying to do with your career. Yes. And then balancing that passion and that momentum mm -hmm. and that time commitment mm -hmm. with a traditional eight to five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. So, I mean, once I actually left Sac State, that's when I went over to work for state government job. And I've been truly blessed. I think that that was the universe telling me, like, you made the right decision because the space that I ended up, which is the California Student Aid Commission, it's really, it, it feeds my passion in the way that I still get to work with students, but it's with students across the state of California. And it's to also support students with giving them financial aid. And there's no way I would have been able to actually afford college if I didn't have, you know, the Cal Grant and financial aid to actually support my journey. So it still feeds the passion in terms of, you know, supporting students. But what it also does, because in the role that I'm in now as a communications manager, it's all about, you know, marketing and um, communications and social media. I lead those efforts for the entire state agency. And so the training that I get there and the support that I get there and all the information that I'm getting, I mean, it helps, of course, my role at the commission, but also these, those are all transferable skills as well. And mm -hmm. so it applies everywhere. And so it helps me, I think, holistically on a personal and professional level. And in terms of boundaries, I think, you know, it goes back to how I manage my own time. So, you know, sometimes, yes, that does mean like at lunch or after work or sometimes at night, I'm going to be working on my own personal business stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it is about having that balance and really coming up with a schedule that also works to just support all of that. Mm -hmm. We had a really uh, beautiful person come and share their experience season one about mm -hmm. how they had their own personal consulting business for almost 20 years, wow. but still had this very robust professional experience in HR which HR is just like, I'm, I always seem it's so rigid. I'm like, oh my gosh, HR, straight paperwork. Like there's no room for like anything gray. And they said that their latest job, their latest promotion, while they had all these skills and all this experience and even all these like credentialing, it was their side business that actually set them apart from other candidates and got them the job. And it was the first time I think Emma and I had heard somebody say that they put their own business on their resume right and didn't have two resumes they made one and gave their own business weight to actually say i'm actually doing this full time on my own i know how to get this done in a major way and i also have these other things to back it up and i feel like with you listeners should know too like you are able to use your own platform to leverage this new opportunity in this state agency but it's also taboo to talk about like don't share mm -hmm. what you're doing after five because we don't like that. But that's actually what's setting folks apart, right? So how does that define you professionally now? Do you feel like your professional identity has shifted in some way? Yes, on so many levels. And I will just use this frame like I own my power. Mm -hmm. And I think once I left higher ed, I started to explore that more. Because to be honest, like I was afraid. I'm like, what is this going to mean? Like if I do bring this up in higher ed spaces, I think some people are supportive, but like any other thing when you're exploring, sometimes people may not. And that just happens with any decision that you make. But when I left higher ed, I was like, no, anywhere that I go, I'm going to just embrace like everything, including the business, because this is something that can help in so many different environments. And actually, you know, I was in my first role at the commission for six months and I got promoted to the communications manager and 
that's not like a thing that just happens regularly. Right. And when I interviewed for this job, I actually talked about my platform and I talked about scholars of color, which is another aspect of the platform. And I showed them my website. And that was the first time that I had ever done that in a professional setting. I was like, but if I want to be, you know, fully seen, I want to be fully seen as myself and everything that I have to offer the world. Mm -hmm. And I want to be taken seriously for everything that I have, especially these skills. And so it did play a role because then we started to think about what, like, you've created this platform for professionals out there. What can also be done here in this space with, like, students and, like, Mm -hmm. marketing efforts and being innovative? Mm -hmm. And so now I get to use those skills Mm -hmm. for that, you know, the agency to go ahead and see how we can also promote the things that we're saying. Mm -hmm. What did that feel like for you, pulling up your own personal website in a job interview? Because I think of when students come to see me, there are kind of these careers that you assume you have a portfolio to present. Mm -hmm, So maybe mm -hmm. something like graphic design or interior decorating or, you know, whatever, usually some of those more creative fields will bring up, but you're interviewing for a state position, which traditionally speaking, I think many people think of the state as being pretty like old school matter of fact, Mm -hmm, right. mm -hmm. And check all the boxes and the application just feels very different. So for you to go into that space and then say, here's my own personal website, here's a feel for what I right, do, Right. What, what did that feel like for you? Yeah, um, to be honest, you know, it was a little nerve wracking because I had never done that before. Mm-hmm. And I think what helped is that I had already been at the agency for six months, but still I was pretty new. Um, and I don't know how often people actually do that, especially, you know, at, in, a, in a state type of environment. Right. Um, and so... But at the same time, I mean, it was kind of like the excitement that you get where it's like you have some fear behind it, but you're also very excited. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, I'm like, this is a communications role. Like I do so much marketing and brand strategy and so many things for my own platform that I know people are impressed by. And I would hope they also would be impressed by it. So I was like, here's my chance. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I did. And it was cool because, I mean, you know, we're in a COVID environment. So I also interviewed via Zoom like so many other people. And like the screen sharing aspect of it too, it it also <laughs> like helped. Oh I know, right? Gosh. But you have to worry about that too. Yeah. Um, but when I was scrolling through all the profiles and all the scholars of color, and like, it was also amazing and affirming to me because I was like, wow, like you've created this. Yes. Yeah. And look at all these people that are part of this platform. Like, this is amazing. And so it was like, hey, I'm interviewing for this role. Of course, I want this role. But at the same time, it was an affirming experience for me. And, you know, the advice that I would have, especially for students, is that, like, finding your passion, I think, is also important outside of, like, how much money that you're going to make or, like, the, like, quote, unquote, like, connections that you're going to make. I think that you can find ways to actually blend the two. And sometimes, I think, sometimes people feel they need to separate them. Mm -hmm. So it's, like, my passion lives here Mm -hmm. and then my eight to five and, like, my livelihood in terms of making money lives here when in fact they can live together if we're given the chance to actually explore what that means Mm -hmm. and also own our identities and own our power. So when we walk into rooms or when we go ahead and have those conversations, it's like, yes, I work for state government and I also am a business owner. And so those identities, I think in those titles, I know Melissa and I have talked about this, it's like, own that you're a business owner, own that you're a founder, that you're a CEO. Mm -hmm. No matter if you have like one employee, if you have like 200 employees, like it's about owning those identities. Mm -hmm. The confidence you have about uh, speaking about your business and that is what I'm hoping listeners are picking up on, right? You said this is literally two years in, yeah, right? But it's also something that you were able to leverage to help you move forward in your life and actually make a lot of fulfilling decisions in your life. But you also understood that you had to give it your own weight first. Like you had to give it. Nobody had to give it to you. You had to believe in it. You had to give it to you. You had to pour into it for people to take you seriously. And then the time and energy you put around it is what helped elevate you. But it started with you, right? No one had to tell you like make a website. You thought like, I should probably put a website together, you know? And those things are important for anybody out there that's thinking like, is this something I want to do? Well, give it a try. Yes. Right. And yes. tell me that you're the founder of it. Put the the weight on you being yeah. the creative director and visionary for this so yes. that we can actually give it the life it deserves. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I think part of this, too, is that so many people are going out and leveraging their own approaches to business that I kind of think, at least for me, it makes people skeptical. Mm-hmm. Right. Because on the 
on the flip side of that, it's kind of like, well, anybody can go and just start their own business now, especially around life coaching. Mm -hmm. I think a lot Mm -hmm. of people look at this specific industry as, well, all of the like psychologists, Mm -hmm. future therapists, dropouts that couldn't make it Mm -hmm. went and pivoted to life coaching because they couldn't cut it for licensure. Mm -hmm. At least that's something that I've heard Mm -hmm. in this Mm -hmm. space. So really being able to feed into that confidence and to present this business as one being legitimate and Mm -hmm. two being able to confidently convey that, especially in year one, Mm -hmm. I just think of how difficult that must have been for you. Yes. Um, Haters exist. So let me just say that. <laughs> Can okay? we like, quote that? Haters exist. Um, <laughs> energy vampires exist. I mean, I got an email and I still very much remember this email. It was within year one. Actually, it was a couple of months in when I first started offering out like the life coaching services. And I got an email. I will save you from the curse words in it. But I got a hateful email that was basically like, you're a fraud. No one wants to buy these services. Stick to higher ed and your job. Mm. And I was still in higher ed at the time, actually. And so I think the difference was that at that point, I had already really worked on my worthiness. And I work on my worthiness every day. I think that's like an ongoing journey, right? Mm -hmm. But I think at that point, I had solidified like, no, this is an actual thing. And I believe in it. It starts with me. So when I looked at that email, I'm just like, it is what it is. Like, haters are going to hate. Like, it's always, we're always going to have people that are not going to be happy with the decisions that we make. Mm Mm-hmm. But ultimately, it comes back to us. Like, are we happy? Are we feeling fulfilled by our own decisions? Because you could be, like, living out a life that people love and feel like you're really happy when in reality you're not. Um, So when I read the email, I was just like, well, you took the time to go to my website, fill out this form. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And here I am. Like, I looked at it. I smiled. And I'm like, I still got my run to do. So here I am. And I'm like, and so, yeah, it was, you know, I would get, you know, comments and I would get things. It's just like, oh, you really think that's going to take off? Like, shouldn't you really like stick to something that's more consistent? And it's like, yo, like I've done so many things. I've won the awards at conferences. I've done the student affairs life. Like I've been the regional chair and like all this stuff. And yes, I loved it at the time, but I wasn't completely fulfilled. And so... It's like, I can have all the accolades. I can have all these people think that I'm like super successful, but if I'm not feeling fulfilled deep inside, then to me, it's not, you know, it's just not the thing to do. And so I think, again, all of those things can coexist, but it does start with that self-exploration. So for me, it's like, I'm going to get this commentary, good and bad, but it's about, you know, sticking to my commitment to myself, this business, and just like what I'm trying to do to also help the world because it goes beyond just making money for me. Mm Mm-hmm. I just feel like you just had the best quote of all time. I'm just like basking that. I'm like, haters exist. I'm like, wow, so simple, but yet a gospel. Thank you. (laughs) So Uh, true. I was uh, talking to a mentee. Uh, at a program that we recently had a community out uh, a community event that we had together and we were working together and um, she had some aspirations to be an entrepreneur and I'm really big on like taking you along with me mm. like let me model a template yes. that could work so you don't have to do it by yourself let me work with you yes. and you can shadow me but also let me empower you at the same time so that when you fly you're in confidence instead of flying like I think I got a wing and a half but I'm gonna just roll with it no you're in, you're confident about this yes. right because you've had this like mentorship. And she was able to be surrounded by all these other folks that had started businesses too. Mm. And I mean, one of the folks that we spoke to, she started her business in March and she quit her job this weekend. Wow. Wow. She said, oh yeah, it's over. Because she had found something that was functional for her and that she loved to do. And my mentee hearing that from someone that is a single mother Right. That was working in, you know, a job and had all their credentials, all the things was like, yeah. So six months ago, started this business and I'm thriving. So actually, I'm actually quitting this weekend and moving forward in my own business. And you could just see her mind go. Entrepreneurship can't exist. Yes. Right. Happiness can exist. Changing can exist. Shifting can exist. And you could be actually really successful. Right. And you're not alone in doing that, which I think she was just like in awe of hearing that within six months and with you saying two years you know even that short time span even with all the haters that will probably Mm -hmm. tell you like this is not going to work there's still successful people out there that are making it work every day yep and it's super important i mean even think about amazon amazon was not the amazon that we know and love today Mm -hmm. they Mm -hmm. were just slinging books yep you know it's like open like you you want a book here you go and now 
they've even changed the meaning of the Amazon. And they're the first thing you think about, actually, right. versus the rainforest, which is huge. Right. All because somebody said, I think this is going to be a good idea. Mm-hmm. And regardless of what people say, I'm going to move forward in it. And y'all can just watch yes. my dust. <laughs> right? You can, you can just catch me later. No, I'll be here when you're ready to talk. But you can just watch my dust. You know? So shout out to Martin for that. But I think it's great. And I think, you, you know, someone even sharing with you, like, taking the time to hate. Right? Like, to literally go. First of all, did you like the visuals? Because I, I specialize in marketing. So were you good with that as you wrote this comment? But also probably finding inspiration to see two years later, oh, well, Michael's still thriving, right? So I think it's important for for listeners to hear that. And I also think, too, important to recognize that side hustles can pivot in a variety of directions, right? So for your one friend, that may look like, okay, I bossed out for six months and now here I am ready to launch full time into this. This could be also something where you're like, I just foresee this being on the side or part-time forever because that's what works for me. And I don't really want to commit to the full-time entrepreneur lifestyle. So this will hang out on the side and I'm happy with that. Right. So I love all of the autonomy that this can bring to somebody because ultimately it's your choice of where you want it to go. You can cap it if you don't want it to grow to that extent. Right. right? And so I think also opening up the discussion around that is important too, around, Hey, this can look basically however you want it to. Absolutely. I mean, just think of all the folks that are maybe doing like DoorDash or mm-hmm, Uber, mm-hmm. right? Or, you know, all these different things where you do, you have full autonomy. You know, you can turn it on and off when you want, make some extra income when you want, and yep. it's totally fine. It doesn't have to be a full-time mm-hmm. thing, but if you need some extra cash, like, why not? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Totally. Well, Michael, we appreciate you coming on today, yeah. but w- before we let you go, we have one last question that of we like course. to ask all of our guests, and that is... What advice would you give to those who are either looking to start or shift their career? Yeah, you know, I, I'll go back to actually what you were just talking about, that having a side hustle or business or whatever you want to call it, things can shift. And so being okay with that from the beginning, I think that because I was so used to just living such a structured out life, being in higher ed especially, right? Like you have to plan all these agendas and all these conference and all this stuff. And it was like trying, I was trying to go ahead and actually bring that into my business, not realizing that, you know, it's not going to work out the same. And so for me, it's like being okay with the pivots and Mm -hmm. the shifts because there have been many, even in the last two years, um, you know, coming up with pillars that happened a year in, like I didn't have any of that in the beginning, having a brand and a logo and all those things came later. So you don't have to have it all figured out at the very beginning. It could take years. And then, you know, years later, you just retransform again, like that happens And so I think the advice is just learning to be okay with things just changing. I think we're human beings. We're consistently going to be transforming. Um, I'm a Scorpio. It is Scorpio season. So that is about transformation. So, um, you know, speaking to that, I think just allowing yourself to just change. Because if you're not changing, I think there's more of an issue. Um, Because if you're just staying stagnant in the same, you know, emotional state or um, level of knowledge, I mean, there's so much like wonderful things out in the world to learn. So just allowing yourself to do that. Social media is a great place to start. Just look at people that inspire you, like look at what they're doing. In most cases, people will want to talk about their journeys and how they got there. Send a DM, like it is okay. Send a DM. The worst that could happen is they don't respond. But I have reached out to so many people that have actually just explained their journey, have given me some of the logistics, the tools that they use. And it's been so helpful to just be able to collaborate. But yeah, like send the DMs, go on LinkedIn, like send a message, send an email. Again, the worst that could happen is they don't respond. But I think in most cases, a lot of people do. I think that's great to hear. And I think it just reminds people, you know, the shift is actually is, is easier than you think. Yeah. Right? You know, you could be a DMO, you could be a tag away, you could be a hashtag away, you could be a post away from yes. everything you're actually looking for, you know. So, so true. Thank you for sharing that too. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Michael. Where can listeners find out more about you if they are curious to look into your work a bit more? Thank you. Yeah. So, I have a website. So, it is www.reclaimingyourhappinesswithlemus.com. So, all the social channels are on there, but I am most on Instagram. So if you look me up, it is at Arise with Lemus, and I am most often on Instagram. So yeah, if you can feel free to find me there as well. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. 
Oh my gosh, I'm just taking a deep breath because I just was so excited about the conversation. Absolutely, Melissa. What do you think was your favorite takeaway from today? That you can blend. Like Mm -hmm. you can blend all these different things and they can coexist in the same space. And you don't have to feel like I have to end this one thing before I start this other thing or I have to have the right time or the right resources, right, or have this right conversation. I can just literally think something is a good idea and explore that and and give Mm -hmm. it the energy that it deserves. So if it's supposed to grow, it can organically Mm -hmm. without feeling I have to risk everything if I'm not ready at the moment. I think of the term analysis paralysis Mm. where you're just, it's like, I don't know what to do. And so I freeze. Mm -hmm. And so hearing that flexibility and that willingness to pivot and just kind of make it work however you see it working. Right. I think that really liberates people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm so happy you bring that up. Mm Mm-hmm. I thought we had a great episode today. Thank you all so much for joining us for season two of the Hired Podcast here with Emma and myself. We appreciate you sharing space with us and we'll catch you here. Same time, same place. Sex Seat number one. Stingers up. Bye, y'all.